first speaker today is Bill Lang. Uh, Bill runs a small business association. Uh, Bill, I'd like you to um, introduce yourself, please, and tell me a little, little bit about your association and, and what's happening in the general business world at the moment. Hello, everyone. My name's Bill Lang. I'm the executive director of smallbusinessaustralia.org. That's where you'll find us. Um, we uh, gather research and advocate uh, on behalf of the 5 million people that own or work in small businesses in Australia. So major employer, more important than being a major employer, uh, really the hearts and souls of their local communities. Those small business owners, uh, you know, that provide work experience for the school kids, sponsor the local footy club, you know, provide the prizes for the trivia night and populate organisations like Rotary all around the world. Uh, so more than the uh, economic importance and employment importance, um, we're doing a lot of things and working very hard, particularly using research to lobby the government to make some changes to give as many small business owners the chance of having their business survive uh, you know, through this period, uh, particularly businesses uh, that are struggling and struggling very heavily through no fault of the business owner. This is not a question of uh, fraud or incompetence or deception. Uh, but there are a large number of small business owners you know, facing insolvency, possible bankruptcy through no fault of their own. So our organisation is, uh, is working hard. We've been in contact with 600 MPs this week, state and federal, uh, asking for some very specific changes to be made to bankruptcy laws so that no small business owner will be made bankrupt through this period. Uh, we are getting a hearing um, and I'm hopeful that we'll see some changes that will improve that situation sooner rather than later. The other major thing that we've been asking for in the last few days is uh, something much more simple and much more direct, uh, what we've been calling a small business saver package where businesses would be paid directly in amount of money here in Victoria in particular to get through the next uh, six week period. Uh, we have seen some changes announced by the uh, Treasurer and Prime Minister last night to what they call JobKeeper. But for any of you out there in business that have been navigating JobKeeper to date and trying to work out how all this stuff works, unfortunately, we're getting too many things that have you know, got uh, fancy names and lots of gobbledygook to try and work out whether in fact uh, you're entitled to them and putting a lot of extra stress on bookkeepers and accountants and advisors. Uh, it's good to get some extra support, but it's still from our point of view, way too complicated. We need to see uh, things to be simpler to be much fairer uh, and therefore they'll be better for everybody involved. Uh, the last couple of things, Barry, I'll mention is um, in the next week or so, uh, we have a number of very large corporations in the country, uh, including National Australia Bank, uh, News Corporation, uh, and as of today, Australia Post, uh, that are helping provide a whole bunch of resources for small businesses through Small Business Australia uh, to help them do a couple of things. One, to keep well, uh, both them, their staff and their customers, uh, and then secondly, to really promote and support buying locally. And whether that's buying face-to-face, -face, which we can't do much of in uh, Melbourne in particular at the moment, uh, but certainly many businesses have already moved online or they've still got telephones. Uh, so that uh, whole buy local movement uh, and all the resources are available for free to any small business owner who wants to tap into it at smallbusinessaustralia.org. Uh, so other than that, uh, Barry, we've also organised a bunch of um, cash saving opportunities for any free members of Small Business Australia, uh, including one which is a $150 straight off your electricity bill uh, you know, from a company that operates uh, almost nationally uh, and is consistently in the top two best priced electricity providers for small businesses in the country. So again, uh, join Small Business Australia. Uh, you'll see where there are member discounts and offers available. And that's just one you know, simple example of where at least 150 will go into your pocket. Not to mention, you'll actually be on a much better deal than what most businesses are now. Thanks, Barry. What about your, the mental health of your members? What, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, as we uh, talked about at your meeting uh, in the last week or so, uh, it's a big issue. Uh, I had, unfortunately, at least six uh, suicides of Melbourne-based small business owners reported to me in the first week of July. So we don't track uh, overall causes of death and make them public like we are with things like COVID every day uh, at the state level, uh, but there is a significant mental health wave and death by suicide issue taking place already. Uh, and that's why um, you know anything that people can do to keep in touch with, particularly people who could be suffering small business financial stress is going to be very helpful. 
Uh, we have some other resources around, uh, you know, how to help the business survive and the practical things to do. And there's also the, uh, the services are available for people to tap into professionally. Uh, but as I said the other night, there's going to be no shame in having to close your business down because of COVID. Uh, there's going to be many ways out of it. And the people that love you want you to stay around. It's going to go on for years, isn't it? Well, look, I think, um, you know, it, it, you know, I think at a bare minimum, I just saw some research uh, 30 minutes ago that's just been released. 30% of the 2 million small business owners in Australia don't see their revenue coming back at least for 18 months, at least. And that's as of today. And if you had, had you asked me the question last week, I wouldn't have said it was that high. So, you know, this is uh, a crisis that continues to unfold. Uh, but the, yeah, the, the key thing for everyone is to keep themselves well and the people around them well, you know, mentally and physically, uh, with respect to the business itself to absolutely minimise cash outflow. Uh, and for everyone that you know, needs to buy things is to be looking to go local, to work with your local businesses to support the hearts and souls of our local communities. I, I guess for me, my first experience of, of being in business was back in 1983 uh, after Ash Wednesday as a, uh, as a young... Uh, as a young, ambitious 19-year-old, I thought it would be a great idea to set up a business in Cockatoo in the Dandenongs. And uh, I got to experience uh, running, running a business as a young, as a young fella um, after what was, what was back then, uh, what was regarded as our, our country's worst bushfire. Um, fast track that up to 2009, um, after being in business in the printing industry, I had a printing business for 25 years. I uh, was a president of our business association in the King Lake Ranges. And so going through uh, Black Saturday there, I can see Kim's, Kim's on the line there. Kim, Kim would probably have heard, heard some of this before. But um, so I, I was sort of, uh, I guess, inherited the position of heading up economic recovery, uh, particularly in the King Lake Ranges, and then, and then appointed by the Shire to sit on the two Shire um, uh, tourism recovery, and then um, then graduated, I guess, from that to sit on the regional tourism <coughs> board, and and then and then chair that with Shepparton, um, Mitchell Shire, Strathbogie, and and and, um, and Murrindindi. I think the thing that I saw, uh, I guess, from there, we worked on a number of different projects um, for those Rotarians. I'm the charter president of the Rotary Club of King Lake Rangers. We felt that setting up a, a Rotary Club in, 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 in our community was one of the best ways to help re recover and rebuild a lot of the infrastructure and a lot of the community wellbeing. Um, and that's been going pretty strong. I think um, uh, Barry asked Bill a question in relation to mental health. And it's one of the things that I've uh, saw firsthand in the King Lake Rangers population of three and a half thousand people. Um, we had something like 250 ABNs that we were managing and that's in relation to agriculture, business, uh, tourism, hospitality uh, and, and trades. Uh, mental health was a big issue that we experienced uh, and also we found that a lot of the support, particularly through the Red Cross money, couldn't go towards um, commercial activities so we had to find ways to support business but most importantly we had to give business people the opportunity to actually decide that they didn't want to be in business as well. Because one of the things that over the last few years, because of my roles, I've worked also in the drought areas in, in um, outback Queensland. And I found that a lot of the, uh, those working on the, the stations and farms were feeling pressured to continue. Uh, and as we know, drought in our country has been going on for a decade. And some of them feel emotionally um, bound to stay on the land and, and just to keep them and, and mental health, unfortunately, is uh, is taking a lot of our a lot of our, um, our business people. So I think it's something that we should give them the chance to. It, we weren't born business people; we've chosen to be business people, and we can choose not to be business people. And I think with what going through what with something that we haven't experienced in our generation or in the last hundred years. Um, I think we've got to be really, really sensible with the way that we go about things. Um, what about forward? What's what's your take on? I mean, this is yeah. This I is think I think Barry. One of the things that I looked at 
after Black Saturday was the lessons that I learned from 1983 after Ash Wednesday. And I found that a lot of, and I'm just going to say this openly, I found a lot of government people um, have not learned from past experiences. Um, and so I think that we should try and take note of, of, of uh, lessons learnt previously and wisdom. Um, and that's what I think we should be looking at. I mean, I've been looking at what, what, what's gone on with the Spanish flu and how, that, how they went worked through that. Um, I think we should start looking at, um, and, and particularly working with the, the powers of beef, we get a chance to work with government and you sit down and we can look at creating opportunities for entrepreneurs um, instead of um, the government trying to dictate um, the way forward. It's going, to, it's going to be the business people and, and the community people that actually take, take our country forward, not government. Brad, the, um, how, long, how long is this likely to run for? In, we, I think we've had this discussion before. How long is COVID going to run for? Barry, they haven't they haven't they haven't found a, a, a vaccine for COVID eighteen or, or seventeen. Not so, so much COVID. I'm talking about the, the 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 stresses that the people are under now. That lingers yeah. on for quite some time. Yeah, we found one of the one of the problems we found that people lost hope, and we find that even in the drought areas that people lose hope. So what we can do is encourage hope because it's, um, Bill mentioned about suicide and it's because people think I, I can't go on. And, and we've, we've, we're hearing a lot of, of young people. We do a lot of work internationally. So I was listening to the, the comments from the Philippines. Um, you know, they were under restrictions like what we've been under, but unfortunately what's happened is that their, their daily um, uh, count has gone from up to 2000, um, and then of re recently it's gone from four to 6,000. Now they were under strict uh, restrictions like we've been, but their, their, their cases have gone up. Why is that? And I asked them the question and they said, because a lot of people, a lot of people are selfish. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people um, are, are arrogant and are not hearing. So what's going to happen is people are thinking that their life has been taken from them and they're going to... Um, Breach, breach those things. And a, and a problem that we've got too is people that have been uh, living in peaceful times, particularly in the city areas, all of a sudden um, their life has been disrupted and they don't like it. But um, I think people in, in regional areas, uh, droughts and bushfires and things, our lives are disrupted all the time. Mm. So we're used to it. And I think it would be, it would be really useful uh, as I say to the drought people, for them to share their story with people in the city, just to know how to be a bit more resilient and to and to not be so uh, entitled and have a real entitlement attitude in our in our city areas, um, that we understand that um, um, sometimes these things happen and we just got to learn to work through it together. Next speaker is Kim Roycroft. Kim runs a. Uh... Kim, you can, you can come on and tell people what you do and where you are. So my name's Kim Rycroft and I have a property called Saladin Lodge and the property is at Narbathong, so I'm quite close to the Marysville district. So I run a, uh, it's a bed and breakfast event destination and a little shop as well. Uh, and I have all sorts of different events here, weddings and music events and a uh, little conference room as well. So it's a bit of a multi task business which is a bit of fun it's my home also so there's six accommodation rooms plus all the other things that go on here so based on 68 acres so for company during these covert times I've got kangaroos and um, wallabies and wombats and <laughs> and kookaburras etc so it's you know it's not a lonely place by any manner of means but it's but wonderful you've got no, but you've got no people no, that's all right. Well, that's all right. I feel like Shirley Valentine and I talk to the walls. So <laughs> that's what I'm feeling like a bit at the moment. But um, it's wonderful to have this Zoom opportunity to hop on board. So um, I guess from my point of view, from a business point of view, it started for me, I was involved with Black Saturday, lost everything with Black Saturday. So rebuilt and uh, got reorganised again with everything happening, which was fantastic to do. And just, I think it was really extraordinary. It takes a long time to rebuild your business back up. 
So for the first time last November was the best um, year up until November that I've ever had. And, and I had full bookings right through December, January, February, uh, and all of this year. So it was really, I finally felt as if the property had re-established itself even after all that time, because people forget it's not just Black Saturday 2019. It takes, you know, two and a half years to three years just to get your building back again, to get your business back again. So for me, the business really hadn't been going all that long, I don't think. So for me last year to find the end of last year, feel that I was back on top and um, feel I could create a good profit and a business and, you know, claw back was brilliant. And then, of course, we had the bushfires. So I think what was the extraordinary thing with the bushfires and was that, yes, the bushfires affected different regions, but like all the other areas, like here, and I can only really talk for, for what happened here, is that from I had full cancellations across the board with everything, December, January, February, totally nothing was really happening here because um, according to the media, the whole of Australia was a light, you know what I mean? It was, it was very difficult to convince clients to come here, even though we were as green as Hades and we had not bushfire affected. So, um, and even though my heart yearns for those going through it, of course it does, but the impact that it had on my business here was dramatic. So all the way from December onwards. Um, and then of course, I got going for a couple of weeks in March and then bang, again, um, as we've all copped. So, you know, as, as a business with very, very, very little income now, right back and through to, um, you know, December last year, I, you know, I am resilient and I will be resilient, but I've gone through all my savings and, you know, superannuation, well, you know, that was well and truly kicked in back when I needed it for, to recover the business. But because I'm a sole trader, I haven't qualified for any of the business support whatsoever. And that, I just, you know, the feeling of, I mean, they're the rules, that's the deal, and yes, you've got to cop that. But I, you know, as an emotional point of view, it felt like I was hit in the guts um, as my business, I felt, was therefore unworthy of support. So that's been really awkward. And apart from the fact that, you know, mentally you're on the phone to the bank, you're on the phone to, I'm just about to get onto the phone to my electricity company because now it appears my deals are, are now null and void. So I'll be quite interested just to speak to Bill about what this um, electricity is for business. Um, and and you can't, I think the exhaustion comes when you're totally fighting for, you know, you're on the phone for hours upon hours upon hours and you're fighting for this sort of um, support and help. And then you find out due to a clause in the, obviously, you know, it, I read in the clause for the bushfire, for example, that if your business was inadvertently affected, that you could get some help. Well, of course, I didn't qualify for those shires. So, okay, that's fine. That That's, you know, put in the shredder. And then the next one is that the government will give support. But no, because I'm a sole trader, I don't get that 10000 and I don't get the next 10000 and nor do I get the 5000 And And because I'm in the Mirandindi Shire, I don't get the other 5000 So you sort of go, oh, OK. You know, none of this support's available. But I'm very grateful for the job keeper. But that's not enough to keep my business alive. So it's going to be a very difficult decision um, after these six weeks because of the time of recovery afterwards. And even though I'll put all my energy and effort into recreating music events, you know, reinventing the wheel and doing all those bits and pieces, you know, sure, and I've got very loyal clients who will come back. But again, like after the bushfire, that takes years to actually rebuild your business again to a certain point. And it's very difficult to for me to say, okay, what am I going to do? Because we thought the business was opening up. So do I go and look for a full-time job? I don't know, I'm nearly 65. So, you know, who's going to employ me? But at, at the end of the day, this is my business. So I really need to say, what am I going to do here? And yes, it's my home, but I still need to earn an income because of all the 
um, dramatic things that have happened prior and the, and the length of period of time that this particular situation has gone on for. So, yeah, it's certainly, and I, I think the time and effort to, that you do to get on the phone to realise that you don't qualify for grants, all those bits and pieces are, are taking their toll. And, and to be perfectly honest, you, you know, it's a point of exhaustion. And what do you do? You know, I think that's really hard. But, you know, I'm a fighter and I'll, I'll keep going. But it, I think the impact on people personally is massive. It's just massive. So, and I think I'm a pretty resilient soul, but boy, at the end of the day, this is testing all my mantle completely. It really is. And I'm not sure of what the future is, but I'll do my best to get my clients back when I can. And that's a difficult part, of course, because for everyone, like I was on the phone again to some clients who had a booking coming up, of course, that's cancelled. So, you know, you know, people say to me, when, when are you going to be open again? We own Poppy Seeds Deli in Well Street in Frankston, which is uh, pretty much a local institution and has been, uh, been around since 1991. Uh, my wife uh, first opened the doors at Poppy Seeds uh, back in 1991 in September. So uh, next month we celebrate 29 years in business. And despite the fact we've been closed, we're still going to call it a, a birthday as we're still trying to function. Uh, this year has been particularly bad for us, um, not just with COVID, uh, we sort of ended and started, well, we ended last year and started this year with uh, serious illness and death in the family, which delayed our ability to open the doors of Poppy Seeds uh, this year. Uh, we finally did open for the first time on March the 1st and our doors were closed on March the 24th. So this year we've traded for a whole three weeks. Mm. So not easy to take. Uh, yes, we do have JobKeeper, which helps. Um, but uh, as Kim said before, it, uh, it doesn't cover everything. Uh, but, you know, it certainly helps and certainly helps us to uh, keep, keep staff and uh, pay the running costs of uh, a premises which is not operating. Um, we have a huge client base, uh, corporate client base in catering. Uh, we cater a lot of the private businesses and a lot of the government uh, offices in Frankston, but of course there's no call for catering, so we can't even offer that service. Um, the South East Water Building was a huge part of our passing trade uh, for day-to-day -day business, and of course they're all working off-site uh, or from home, and uh, they're not on the street. So whilst we are allowed legally to open the doors, Financially, it's just not viable. So we've been closed. Uh, so what do we do? <laughs> we specialise in all of our uh, foods being homemade, handmade by us. Uh, pretty much everything that you buy from our shop is made by us. Uh, and I think that's what set us apart and has made us so popular and uh, such a long-standing business in Frankston. Uh, and we've come up with an idea which we hope will help us. Uh, every year for 29 years, we have handmade Christmas puddings. And uh, we, this year was to be no different. And we thought whilst we're closed and we can't do anything else, we'll put all of our efforts into promoting that side of the business uh, and um, go into early production. So through our own social media outlets, we put, uh, put the notice out that we were going to do this. And um, the response has been phenomenal. Yeah. A lot of our regular clients that order the puddings every year have ordered them. They're ordering two and three because they want to give them as gifts to family or they're having a couple of celebrations or if they're not getting together, they're getting smaller puddings to send out to each of, uh, each of their family members so that they can all enjoy uh, Christmas and, um, and have one of our handmade puddings. So that's, uh, that's basically what, uh, what we've been doing to, to try and keep... Uh, some income and uh, keep the doors open. And uh, the income that we can generate from that can certainly assist in uh, restocking the shop and uh, making any servicing or repairs to equipment so that when we can open fully, we're ready to go. Will you be able to still trade over those the next 16 weeks in some way? Uh, we, the way that we're trading with the puddings is, is virtually all online. People are contacting us uh, either through email or through our social media site and uh, we're communicating with them that way and taking all the orders of what they want. 
so the, the shop door is not open physically, uh, but we are still available to communicate with, uh, with our clients. Because we started a business in 1989, the year that um, someone in their wisdom said, that, you know, we were going to have the recession we had to have. And we spent the 90s sort of growing through a recession. So I've just sort of been using that wisdom um, with a few younger people that, you know, my kids are sort of in their 30s and they're, some of them are in small business and um, a lot of their friends are and, um, there's a few in Madeliza, especially um, Sam at the barber shop. He's really, you know, they've, they've been really struggling to sort of, they're open, they're not open, they're sort of, they don't know where they're standing because what they can do. So um, hmm. um, I think it's really important that we sort of connect with these young people. That, you know, as Barry and I were saying, that it's not their fault that they don't understand. They've always had, um, they're the entitled generation, but they're only entitled because you know, it's not their fault. They've grown up in this era where it has been so good. You know, we've had it as parents of these kids. It's been fantastic times to build our businesses and to build wealth. And the kids have only seen that. So we've sort of got it. I think it's our responsibility to walk the journey with these young people and sort of be there for them and just sort of encourage them and say, it will be all right. And um, I was thinking of with Sam, he runs, he's very connected with Movember because um, he's had sort of some mental health issues himself. He it wouldn't be, you know, um, he would tell you. And he started um, connecting with no, Movember and I was wondering whether something practical that we could do as a group is um, linking to that. And he has monthly get-togethers down at his shop to support young people in their, that, um, in their businesses. And maybe we could sort of, as Rotarians in our cluster, sort of, you know, go down, um, link with him, get him on perhaps next month and link with him and when we are all able to get together again, be part of um, supporting Movember with him and perhaps taking on some of these young people that are in business and working them through this recovery period. And what about um, your particular club? How's that going? Um, now, the club's doing well. Um, most of our members are, um, are in work, so they haven't got any worries. So they're... Um, um, and a lot of our friends, their kids are fine, but um, there are some businesses out there that are struggling in big ways. We'll go over to our panel now and just get a little bit of input from Graham Henderson. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And... Uh... Um, those stories from Kim and Michael uh, were very uh, sad and very challenging and we wish you all the best for your businesses going forward. Um, I'm a, um, now, now fully retired from business, uh, fully retired around four years ago. Um, I'm a CPA and have been for over 50 years. Um, and I've spent over 50 years in business, 25 years multinational business, including 10 years as a chief financial officer for the uh, East Asia region, the Nicholas Kiwi Group. Um, and then I um, spent, uh, have spent over 27 years running a 70 year old third generation family business. Um, and I'm currently a non-executive director of that business, family business and a shareholder with my wife. Uh, for over eight years, I was on the national board of Family Business Australia um, and fulfilled the role of um, Chairman of the Finance, Audit and Risk Committee. Uh, Family Business Australia is a great organisation that supports families in business. Over 70% of businesses in Australia are family owned businesses and uh, over 50% of people employed in Australia work for family owned businesses. And as Trudy mentioned about her family business, um, that hers is just one of many, many family businesses. I've been a member of the Rotary Club of Frankston for over 25 years and uh, I'm now currently the interim chairman of the Matt Eliza Bowling Club. So I've had a lot of uh, history and experience in uh, business, whether it be multinational business or in uh, smaller SME type businesses uh, with my own family business. But I believe um, my one take on uh, this whole scenario uh, and looking back over 50 years of my involvement in business is you've got to remain positive but realistic. And I believe firmly that we'll win through in the end. Thanks, um, Graham. I'll hand over now 
to um, to Bill Redfern. Bill, what do you bring to the table? Uh, thanks, Barry, and thanks for the invitation to join. Uh, for those who are not aware, um, over the last three years, I've been focusing on provision of financial counselling services as part of a not-for-profit community organisation. Uh, financial counselling is focused on supporting individuals who are struggling with unmanageable debt, usually inadequate income and have got themselves into trouble. Uh, so what can I bring to uh, the, the, the That focus has been on individuals, not businesses. So I've probably got a question rather than a contribution. My question is, in the business, small, in the small business sector, when you're struggling and you need support, who do you turn to? Mm. And if you're struggling, I assume you can't afford necessarily to be turning to your fee-for-service um, network because uh, you can't afford them. So are there resources available for the small business operators who have exhausted their own capacity either emotionally or um, in terms of um, knowledge of their solutions. Just so I throw that question to the group. Do you see our club fitting into that? No, Kim, can I put that question to you? As an individual who appears to be doing well in coping, extremely challenging, but if you felt you were unable to cope, mm. is there anywhere you can turn to that you know about? Certainly. First of all, after Black Saturday, it was the Rural Counselling Service. So, and they were sensational. Um, and the ones in there helped keep me going. Without those, I think I would have sold, you know, had a farce out. <laughs> uh, so I am coping, but it's with not without consequences of covert curves because after speaking to uh, my accountant and the banks and the, you know, all the other things, I tell you what, I do turn to chocolate. But anyway, <laughs> that gets me through. But now um, I have to admit that uh, because obviously with Black Saturday, I have an enormous debt and all with what's happened and really not having very little income since December, I have now said, well, now what? And so I have turned to financial planners to see if, if I can coordinate my loans together and it becomes impossible because so I've gone to numerous financial planning people with banks you know and to say can I put all this in one and as soon as you say that your your age your uh, you know sole trader the debt you have and that um, so you pay I'm paying a high interest rate for things that I have so as soon as you say all those things and, and that you have your own business, I've hit, you know, four brick walls. So for the, you know, those sort of to try, what are they called financial? Um, I don't think they're called financial planners, but, you know, to get all your finances together and you can go with that. So, you know, I've turned to people, four different people with the scenario that I have just to try and get a fair and reasonable interest rate instead of paying the interest rate I have. And I've hit brick walls completely. So, and I've even gone, obviously, to the banks that I've got loans with and asked them for a fairer and kinder rate um, and to give me a bit more time to pay interest only until, you know, then once we can sell, then, okay, that's fine. We, we, it all gets null and void. And I've hit brick walls throughout. So, and I feel that, yes, my circumstances due to all these things are very difficult. So... Now, I just think, well, I don't know who else to turn to. And I think my scenario is it was interesting to say you've got to know when to quit. So as much as I'm not prepared to give up on this as a, my home, I'm certainly not prepared to give it up as a business. So it's very difficult. So, but maybe it's time. You know, I think you hit brick wall. So I don't know who else to turn to at the moment. But some has been, well, the practical advice is maybe being given, Kim, we can't do this. So then because it's, I've gone through so much time without the finance, without money, income coming in, maybe that has, you know, it's the red light is drawn and the line is drawn and maybe 
you know, but yeah, I guess I'll always go to the um, 11th hour and hence I'm, I've had built, been able to build my business successfully right up until November. So I guess I'm an optimist and think, well, you never know. Let's so, see. So where, where are you on the dial? Say that again, Barry, sorry? Where are you on the clock dial? Are you nine or ten or eight? Oh, I would definitely be nine and a half. Okay. All right. Hey, can mm -hmm. I ask you a question, please, Kim? Mm-hmm. Um, come, assuming we get through six weeks and everything works out, the numbers come down and everything like that, and so the, what, what's going to happen on in week seven? Sure. Well, week seven, assuming that... Well, week seven will just go back. We're in stage three lockdown here in yep. here in Asia. So it'll just go to to um, lockdown two, perhaps, for us. Okay. But in Melbourne, it'll just go to lockdown three. Yep. You know, that's Do you have a, a marketing plan on the shelf that's going to come off the shelf in week seven? Can you say that again? Sorry. Do you have a marketing plan sitting on the shelf waiting to implement? I, oh, definitely. I think for uh, absolutely. So for me, it's it's e me emailing all my bank of people who can come, but my business really does come from Melbourne. Let's face it. Yeah. Um, and we thought that you know we can get a couple of sporadic ones from all other regions, but you know no matter what, they still don't want to travel around. Yeah. Um, it's not like you know I went up to Mansfield the other day, and for Mansfield, it's been a different scenario because people will travel to Mansfield because the snow was still opened there, the mountain was still open. But for here, I'm at the end of the line. At, at, um, you know, sort of really no one comes to Marysville and this district, it is the end of the line, but people draw up from Melbourne. So I guess it depends on what's happening with Melbourne and until we really know what's going to happen with Melbourne. But certainly as soon as Melbourne can open up and people can come, then, yeah, for sure, I've got um, active things which are ready to put into place immediately, sculpture gardens, music events, yep. uh, you know, discounts on accommodation, et cetera, et cetera. And I've, you know, um, obviously with email, contacting people to say, really looking forward to seeing you. I've held off, um, you know, other accommodation that's been booked, giving them another discount in order for them to keep their booking. If they could keep their booking, I want to give them a free dinner, you know, so lots of incentives to say, you know. So a lot of, dis lot of discounts, it's, which is uh, you can probably can't really afford is a, is a challenge. Well, for. yeah, I, th I think incentives. I think I have to look at it that way and then you just build it slowly. Yeah. Um, that's the best you can do, really, is give yeah. people incentives and you, and they want a gift as well. You know, that they, you're all going through, everyone's going through this hard time. So they want a bit of a gift, I think, also, which is really fair. But also to exploit the fact that they can come up here and, and this is what I found, the conversation when I was able to open up and people in Melbourne were, were still quite restricted, but they could come up at that stage is to say, you know, come and enjoy nature, just come and be able to absolutely run on, you know, I mean, I can only talk personally, but for the district, but as well as here as 68 acres, knock yourself out. You yeah. know, you've got fresh air and all the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Barry. But it's tough. It's really tough. It is. How to reinvent the wheel again. How big is the database? Oh, probably around about 5,000. So yeah. that's a reasonable database. And, of course, I'm on to all the tourism organisations, which I, you know, enjoy being on, and we get a lot from that as well. So about 5,000. Good. Hello. Mm. Great. Yeah. Uh, just, just one uh, to answer Bill's question about well, where do businesses go or small businesses go. Um, small Business Victoria, which is part of the state government, um, I don't think they do a great job of promoting themselves and telling people what they do, but... I do know that Small Business Victoria offer a lot of uh, um, benefits um, and generally free of charge to small businesses um, to help them get through different aspects of their business. Uh, I did actually spend about three years on the Small Business Ministerial Council um, a few years ago. And, and that, that, that organisation uh, or that department, Victorian go de government department, actually runs mentoring services. And um, um, so if, if, if um, Kim or um, uh, Michael rang uh, Small Business Victoria, 
Uh, there's just one opportunity. The other one, of course, is is one that I would promote, and I know that uh, Bill Lang would promote, and that's belonging to associations such as Family Business Australia and uh, his uh, Bill's Small Business Council, um, which generally is pretty low cost. I mean, to be a member of Family Business Australia only costs you about five hundred dollars. Now, I know that's five hundred dollars, but but those sort of organisations are great support for for people who are going through different challenges within their business because they offer um, advisory services uh, and they can put you on the right path. They run different courses. So some associations are of great benefit to support small businesses um, in, in both good times and bad times. I think uh, Bill's offering free membership at the moment. I'm pretty sure that I'll check that out for you, Kim. Mm, thank you. Yeah, so Bill's very active and uh, I think he's prepared to take on a fair few issues. I mean, he's hard to get, but I'm able to get him when, when I need him. But, um, it's amazing. Uh, you know, that, that's what I want to try and bring out on these sort of meetings where people can network, listen to other people, and maybe it's just that it might only be that one thing and that, that makes all the difference, you know. Um, I have a, a question of Kim. I wondered if I could ask. Mm. Um, I, I'm involved as a director of a ski club and we have a lodge at Mount Buller and one at Falls Creek. Now, we have been given uh, rate relief by the resort management people on both mountains, uh, covering our rates, not necessarily our services, but, it, but at least it helps. I mean, we missed out with closure for the bushfires on both mountains and we've now closed for this winter accommodation wise because we don't have you know we do have common space for kitchens dining and lounge and it's really too difficult to manage we've had to make a decision even though we did a lot of preparation uh, mm. hoping we could open mm. for the season but i did wonder about the um the relief with rates at a uh, at a more local level uh, in this case their state government uh, as a resort management board mm. Certainly, I approached um, my council and the council, as far as not giving a discount, they have been able to say you can pay um, X amount of dollars off per month. So it, all they've put me on to is a payment plan and mm. I will accept any payment plan on, on offer and, <laughs> and uh, certainly have dived into every payment plan I can humanly think of. And so I think that has obviously been of support, but as far as um, a discount, then no, that hasn't come about. So um, yeah. equally, and I think the killer for me is also the um, business insurance. Yes. Very, very difficult to get business insurance, as you would know on, well, for me, running bed and breakfast, because there's so few insurance companies that will touch the bed and breakfasts. Mm. So I've got bed and breakfast conference, the shop uh, event area, and a lake in front and you know i keep telling him it's only like you know one megalitre because i keep asking you have any megalitres as if that makes a difference to whether you drown or not in it but anyway <laughs> you know, um that's really difficult so my insurance has been absolutely no um you know discount or you know availability there which i think you know even though my rate insurance is the best i can get and i've searched and searched and searched um there's still no discount and I do find that disappointing. Mm, yeah, we've, we've suffered the same with respect to insurance. They've told us uh, initially that a maximum of 250,000 cover versus a bushfire. Now for a three storey lodge worth a couple of million each, um, that's a pretty modest recovery. So we are renegotiating and we have actually extended the policy to the end of the winter because we didn't figure a bushfire was going to happen in, in that time. But we are now renegotiating and working with other clubs and, and businesses mm -hmm. to get a better deal. But there is no doubt that mm -hmm. the rate will be increased substantially. Mm -hmm. But we are trying to get a better level of cover mm -hmm. for future seasons. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been very difficult with the Mirandindi Council here, who obviously as a council and as many other councils has been hit and still recovering from the bushfire in 2009, as we all are in this region. Uh, and I think therefore for them, you know, I mean, they, they need to make some money and, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, it's, 
but at least I've been able to pay in increments, which has been fantastic, but certainly discount wise, no. Mm. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Graham Gordon, uh, before I come to you, uh, Kevin, Graham's got a quick word. Um, it, it's really uh, a bit of information for those of us who live in, or well, those of, of you who live in Frankston uh, City Council area. Trudy and I are directors of the, the Committee for Greater Frankston, and an issue that we are uh, actively working on at the moment and, and making a uh, council election issue is, for those who don't know, when rate capping uh, came in, to avoid the need to try to reduce their cost base, Frankston Council took a different tack and applied a 25% levy to all commercial and um, uh, industrial properties in the Frankston uh, council area. So all businesses in Frankston pay 25% higher rate um, than residential properties. So with COVID, uh, I think everybody agrees to come out of it, it'll be a business led recovery, um, people getting back into business and people spending and a 25% levy on business rates doesn't help that. Um, Chris Bollum reluctantly is putting a motion to the council on uh, Wednesday uh, to try to have that uh, removed, but we don't expect it to get up because it's uh, it's not generally seen as something the council wants to do. So uh, it will become an election issue. We feel it was a way of getting out, avoiding uh, a way of avoiding the hard decisions on reducing costs within the council, and certainly doesn't help the businesses in this uh, council area. Um, survive through COVID. The second point I was going to make, I think governments, uh, organisations like us can, can maybe look to contacts we have in other parts of the world as to what other people are, what other uh, countries, organisations are doing to try to get themselves out. And I, I read uh, a really interesting one coming from the UK, some of our friends over there relayed to us, and I haven't actually seen it in the media, but the British government is paying 50% uh, of the bill for three months of anybody who goes to a restaurant um, as a way of trying to get people uh, back into the restaurant to trade and to try to drive revenue through that and get people back into jobs. And I thought that was a particularly innovative thing because you're not giving money to people directly. You're uh, giving money to businesses to try to employ more people and get people out eating in uh, in, in restaurant type of activity. So I think there's there's a number of those sorts of initiatives that we need to look around and see what else other people are doing. Thanks, Thanks Barry. Barry. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Um, I've invited the uh, CEO of the Princeton Council, Phil, on next week. We'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> Kevin Wallace. Good talker. Yeah, <laughs> could you come on, Kevin? <laughs> Yes, thanks, Barry, and uh, good day, everybody. And uh, some enlightening stories there. I hear them every day. Um, just to put you in the picture, I contract the Aussie Home Loans, been with Aussie for 21 years, prior to that with the ANZ Bank for 29 years. So I've seen it all. I've seen uh, recessions. I've seen high interest rates. I've seen, seen it all. And uh, this is probably... Uh, beyond our wildest dream. And as ScoMo said when this uh, first rolled out, we're all in this together and some of us are going to be worse off than others. Now, the thing I've noticed um, in the last 12 months since the Royal Commission is that um, banks have tightened up incredibly uh, hard on people trying to get a loan. Um, living expenses... Um, the things they scrutinise. So the famous case that's um, going through the courts now where the Westpac were allegedly approving a lot of loans without assessing people's true living expenses uh, is a big fight between Westpac and, and uh, ASIC and APRA and so forth. So it's not going to get any easier any soon for the, uh, the normal person in the street trying to get a home loan or a business loan. Now, perfect example, the last five customers that have been referred to me, and on referral basis only, four of those five people have tapped into their super to uh, see them through, um, you know, $10,000 prior to 30th of June, 2020. And then it was open so that you could have another 10,000 after that. So. 
the banks don't like that, especially if people haven't been um, affected by uh, loss of income, loss of hours under the, the guidelines that uh, was allegedly mentioned that you could tap into those $10,000 lot. So if you've got a, a couple that think they want to get ahead and uh, get a home loan and you know, two times 20 is 40 grand just pops in the bank. The bank won't have anything to do with it because it's deemed not to be hardship. So a lot of those people, uh, you know, are, are going to um, wonder whether or not that was the right thing to do. So um, big, big uh, push on by government prior to COVID was uh, a couple of schemes that came out. The first home loan deposit scheme, which means... Uh, basically said that uh, people with 5% savings could borrow up to 95% and uh, there was no mortgage insurance. Um, and then the home builder scheme where the government said you could have $25,000 if you want to renovate a home or upgrade a home and do some renovation. So that last one's still, off, still, still not off the ground yet. It's got to be uh, sanctioned by our state revenue office. So they're obviously been affected by COVID and things have slowed down there. So uh, early super withdrawals, I've got a note here, 30 billion has already been taken out of super and that's expected to go to 42 billion. Um, Aussie people, we're all working from home. Uh, we can't see people face to face. We've got to use Skype, we've got to ID people, uh, whereas they hold up a, a license and their passport, we take a snappy picture. And um, a, lot, a lot of things have, have got tied in the industry and it's not making it hard for people that really want a, a lot of assistance. So I've just got another note here, developers can't uh, get finance because the banks need pre-sales. Um, home loans approvals are at their lowest levels in eight years as per the stats that came out in June. And, um, you know, it's tough times. I've heard these stories before, but I don't think I've seen it as tough as this. Thanks, Kevin. That's great information. Wayne Gillum, could you come on, Wayne? And Yeah, thanks, Barry. Um, I've had a uh, uh, long, fairly successful corporate career uh, prior to uh, owning some business along the way, but uh, I was going to 14, be longer than that. Uh, I've, 2004, I started a business coaching practice uh, in this local area and uh, and grew that business uh, to have a, have a team, uh, which I sold uh, oh, two or three years ago. But so during that time, we we work with hundreds of businesses, and uh, I know times are tough at the moment, but uh, come six weeks or time or something, they're uh, they're coming back to where a lot of businesses have been for a long time. I think. My, my comment, I don't want to be uh, too controversial here, but this, this COVID has accelerated what was already going on. It's brought it forward. That's the negative side of it. It's brought the uh, stress because I found from uh, working with lots of business owners, 80% of businesses owners just buy a job. There's no real plan for growth in the business. So that was what we used to do is, is work with the business owners to develop a go forward plan. I mentioned, asked Kim there before, what's your, Come, come week seven, you should have a, uh, a marketing plan that's much bigger and bolder than anything else you've ever had before because you know, I, I, I hear your pain. You need to come back really, really strong. Mm -hmm. you know, you've, you're kicking into the wind and uh, you know, it's time to, time to go then. So that's it's the education in my mind is the key. What are you doing to educate yourself? Because this six weeks or depending on where you are, let, let's uh, be blunt, you're stuffed. You can't really do a lot apart from keep your, try and keep your nose above the water as best you can with all the other support packages. But what are you going to do in week seven? So I, I'm, uh, I just want to put the point because I know we're here for, for ideas and uh, you don't need anyone else to give the uh, the negative ideas. You're like, what, what could you do? So I see um, the opportunity I'm seeing. Uh, one, one is to, there's lots of opportunities for education because that was the one thing I learned from lots of business owners. They, they go into business without adequate business education. Great uh, knowledge of, of what they do in the business, but very little knowledge about running a business. 
and there's I, I heard a couple of, uh, of of things there today that I thought are, must be heartening. And, and Michael, you mentioned one there before. You you've got this. If you've used your database, you've gone outbound, and you've uh, you've got a you had some success. I'm sitting there thinking, well, Christmas cakes. That's a while ahead. I'm sitting at home yeah. uh, drinking cups of coffee because I can't do anything. About it. But I thought, what else could you give me? What else could you send me? Well, um, we've got a uh, uh, database. How can you really grow it? <laughs> you know, put some put some firepower into that database, and I don't know. What I don't, I don't know your business, box, so I can't say. But there must be some sort of desserts, cakes. Food yeah, we we uh, we're specialised in making all of our own food. So yes, you're yeah, right. Desserts, well cakes, uh, famous yeah. for our sausage rolls, things like that. So uh, you know, when when we reopen, uh, we can look at um, bulk orders, say for, for the homemade sausage rolls or yeah. the puddings or cakes or anything else that we make. Uh, we can look at um, having them pre-packaged, ready to go, so people can uh, buy them with uh, very little to no contact with us, if that's still yeah. a requirement. Yep. Um, you know, the coffee machines are always on if people want coffee yep. and, uh, you know, we'll you just rebuild that way. The party it'll be, it'll be, yeah, it, look, it'll be baby steps, I know, uh, yeah. because we don't oh, know how to react. Sorry, pardon? You turbo charge that because your first step, if you like, uh, I'm not, I hope I'm not doing you a disservice here, your first step from passing trade, which is, let's face it, in Well Street, it's been challenging yes. for a long time, yeah? Yeah. And it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's yeah. not going to get any 29 years better. it's been challenging. It's not, gonna, it's, yes. it's not gonna get any better. It's terrible down there, isn't it? So it's you, it's you, pretty quiet. Um you've been proactive you've got there's, some success. Uh, Let's do more of it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll certainly give it a best shot. <laughs> oh, I think you can, yeah. It we, sounds good. The opportunity as I see right now, it's never been easier to go online. Um yeah. those that know me I'm just the immediate past president of uh the Frankston Rotary Club and uh during my term we got hit with COVID. Couldn't have any more meetings. And uh, with the help of the likes of Barry and Robin, we sort of had to wrestle with that. And so, what are we going to do here? Can we do we shut up shop? What do we do? We shut up shop for a couple of weeks. Well, this is this isn't going to work. So we, you know, long story short, like a lot of clubs, have got online. But I don't reckon if we tried to do this a year ago, it wouldn't have worked. There, was, there would have been zero attendance. But people are more. I think we've been forced online. into this. Yeah, but that's a business opportunity because after at the end of this, they're still going to do it. It's so good. We have board meetings uh, online, which are much better than waiting for late at night after a rotary meeting to have them. Uh, there's all those sort of communication things that are positive, but they're good for business too. So as soon as you take your business online now, people are going to accept it. Uh, guess what the other, other positive thing? Your competition are all stuck on their thumbs. It's the government's <laughs> fault. It's everyone else's fault. It's a blame game going on. You can sneak in under their garden. You, you, can, do, you can do a lot of things. Online. So in the old days, when you wanted to start up a retail shop and you had to get a lease and pay a lot of money and stock with a great display, you don't have to do that anymore. You can you can have pictures online. You can do it. You can do virtual stuff, and uh, it doesn't cost much at all. And you can get some traction. I noticed uh, I was reading the newspaper the, uh, the other day. Kogan, uh, completely online retailer, market capitalization two billion dollars. Maya been around forever, huge enterprise. Market capitalization, capitalization, I think, was 160 million. What the hell is going on? Why did they let Kogan get it under their guard? How did that happen? I don't know. They were they're asleep. Clearly, they were asleep. They weren't. There's there's no no plan going on there. They're being reactive. That's the way it's always worked. That's the way it's always going to work. No, it's not going to. We're not going to kind of come out of COVID. No business is going to be the same ever again. So these are the opportunity. Yeah, marketing's much cheaper now than it's ever been. When I started in business, you took a, you know, if you're a small business, you had to take a yellow pages ad. And they absolutely reamed, Trudy's shaking her head, <laughs> nodding. They reamed you, didn't they? Yep. <laughs> I don't yep. know how many businesses I've seen where yellow pages are making more profit out of that business than the owner was. <laughs> they turn up <laughs> every year and try to sell you <laughs> more yeah. and more. Yep. That was their brief, up, up it. And guess what? Yeah. If you don't take it, you won't get it again next year. And oh my God, what will happen if I don't have that? Now you can, you can, you've got choices of, you know, you've got email marketing's cheap, you've got Facebook, you've got Google, you've got lots of things. The most important thing that, that uh, many businesses miss out on them, the, the, the key intellectual property of business is a database. Mm. Tim, you've got 5,000. Mm. You should have 50,000. 
Mm. Start building it. Why, did, why aren't people coming from interstate and around the world to your place? Because it's so unique. And why would they come? Mm. Yeah. If you had the ability while you're sitting yeah. there to yeah, go and market to those people. Let's go, let's go and bring them in. Let's go and get them excited. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about you and other people I know that are retired like me. We can't wait to get, as soon as we're, uh, you know, they uh, mm. release us, we're going, yeah. aren't we, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff and Jeff, Richard and I have been telling we, we're going. And yeah. if, if it's to a place like yours, yeah, can't wait. Yeah. I'm sick of sitting around. I yeah. want to go. And yeah. uh, mm -hmm. if you go somewhere like yours where you're, you're not going to be mixing with people who are going to uh, give you those exactly. germs, it's even better. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, you've got to, you know, there's the, the common word around there is you've got to pivot. What else can I do? How can I do more? How can I be outbound? Because if you're inbound, you're uh, someone else has taken uh, control of your business. Get, get in control. Now I spent 14 years approaching that. So I haven't talked about it for a long time, but I'm, I always get excited when I talk about it. The opportunity just you're excited now. <laughs> the opportunity is great. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. And I'm seeing people, uh, and I'm feeling for you, Kim and and Michael, because I've met so many business owners like you. And if you can just flip it around. Mm -hmm. Things can things can change because let's face it, if you don't, it's a loss. Yeah. yeah. Depressing. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like that. And you, no, it's up to you've me. got a lot of skills there and you've got a great mm -hmm. asset. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're lucky we've got a very good following. And uh, yeah. a lot of the people that we see when we're out shopping or well, when we're out shopping, that's all we do. <laughs> yeah. When are you reopening? When can we come back to you? Uh, so that, that feedback has been very good. Uh, well, nice. My question is, why don't you to. take your business to them? Well, that's that's a possibility too. Um, yeah, we've just got to work out. Uh, we, we'd obviously we've been approached by in the past pre-COVID by uh, Uber Eats and uh, Deliveroo, uh, but they, they want thirty five percent of the sale. Yeah. So you know, it doesn't make it financially viable for us to actually send you something because all the profit is going to the deliverer. Yeah. Uh, so we would probably. If we were going to do that, step in and, and do the deliveries ourselves, make a zone uh, in Frankston that's manageable for us and uh, and handle the deliveries ourselves. We do that anyway with a lot of our catering orders. We uh, we deliver them straight to the uh, the boardroom or office or home or wherever they're going um, so that we know that that works. Uh, but for, you know, for someone to order up just like a, uh, a meal for one, for example, uh, you've got to weigh the cost of... Uh, what that costs over the counter as a sale, uh, as opposed to losing 35% of that as, uh, as someone delivering it for you. Yeah. But anyway, you, you, if you focus on, the, you can solve that problem. Uh, well, I can say to you, I've worked with a lot of businesses, of really big online businesses, and uh, the way they built those businesses uh, initially is, is uh, through eBay stores. Because you've got yeah. to go, it's, it's like having a retail, you've got to go to Chadson. Yeah. eBay's where the, yeah. where the market is, but, what you, what you can do is build a database. Once you've got a big enough database, then you've got power. Yes. Yeah, that's true. And then you can, yeah. then you can, you have scale and then you can start to, uh, to work. But you've got to, you got to build scale. That's your first job. And uh, if yeah. you're not going yeah. to grow and you're going to be dying. So yeah. you can't stand still. So. No, definitely not. Definitely not. Okay. We've actually, uh, I know that um, um, Kim mentioned that she had, trouble with the banks and grants. Um, I've got to say our experience was a little bit different. We, uh, our bank has been fantastic. Uh, literally just a phone call. They've suspended all of our mortgage repayments. Uh, I rang the credit card arm to tell them that their interest rate was too high. They halved it straight away. Um, the two companies that we finance our vehicles through, the same thing. They stopped all the, the vehicle lease repayments on both cars for six months. L literally no questions asked. So we've had a lot of support that way. Uh, the biggest uh, problem that we've had has been with Small Business Victoria. Uh, we were told that we qualified for a grant, so we put the application in, only to be told that we don't qualify for the grant. Uh, so there's a bit of goalpost moving there. But uh, anyway, we're still in further conversation with them because uh, we actually do qualify for the grant. But of course, nothing's been paid yet. Uh, so it's, it's just, just a wait and see. Maybe they're just uh, testing how hard people will push them to actually pay the grant. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, look, I don't know. I, my only suggestion there, consideration there is be careful with government. They distract you too much. Oh, yeah. They take away too much time. <laughs> the time you could be building that plan because if you go to the bank and you've got, you got a really exciting plan, they're going to look at you a whole lot better. Yeah. Yeah. Whether they, they're, they're, there's, Kevin will say they're a, they're a bit strange at the moment. Banks, so there's logic's gone out completely out the door, but uh, oh, at least you absolutely. give them some evidence of, 
to, the, to give them confidence you're going somewhere. Mark, could you just wind this meeting up with a couple of comments, mate? Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Barry. Um, first of all, again, a fantastic uh, discussion, fantastic um, uh, conversations have been going around, and I just thank everybody for sharing some of their stories and that today. It really does bring home uh, the hardships and that that we're, we're going through. Um, yeah, the important thing is, and that's what I love about this, is we're connecting with each other, and that's exactly what the this whole concept is all about. It's you know rotary connections. Um, yeah, we're there to help and support uh, our local. Um, uh, communities and stuff. The people that are here that are offering and facilitating how to, you know, work our way through some of these issues and problems and, and making these connections. I just can't thank you enough uh, for doing that. And I just touch on two points uh, that, that Wayne mentioned. I've, I work in the technology space and I've been trying to convince Rotary Clubs for five years to use technology. I just love it when a plan comes together. It took COVID to make it happen, but hey, people are now connecting via the use of technology. And it does work. Um, sure, it doesn't uh, you know, give you that face-to-face -face, uh, feeling that you do have, but it is still a way. And look at what we can achieve with doing this today. And one of the other things that he touched on, planning. I work in, uh, in a select entry school. Five, six years ago, we started a plan because back then there was this thing called SARS started coming around. And we thought, what if SARS or something equivalent came and interrupted our education? So six years ago, as a school, we started to deliver a lot of our stuff digitally online. You hear all about all these wonderful schools today at looking at the programs and all that that they're doing. Guess what? They came to our school and learned it all from us. They've taken it out there uh, and they're making it own. We're a government school, so we're not allowed to promote ourselves like that. So planning, we did it six years ago. We slipped into the model quickly and easily uh, this year. and. We're, we're, we're absolutely flying. So again, the, the planning for us for coming out of this COVID uh, situation is exactly what Wayne was talking about. We have to plan now so that in six weeks time, 12 weeks times, we can hit the ground running and all of those other people that have been sitting back playing the blame game, they're just going to be six to 12 weeks behind where you are. So I don't have much more to add uh, again. Thank you, Barry, and thank you, Frankston Rotary, for this, this great initiative. Um, please promote this around to people. Barry's got an email address uh, that's there. Share it around with your friends, people who can help, people who need help. Get them in contact, and then this, this group can actually make that uh, happen in some way, shape, or form. Because Rotary opens opportunities, and what opportunity have we been given at the moment? It is just phenomenal. So thank you, everyone. Stay safe, uh, and just remember, we all need support in some way, shape, or form.